Today I'd like to share with you a universal and powerful opening line pawn to b3. In fact, many years ago I recorded a video about this, and since then I received almost all the time some emails or comments of people that are using these lines successfully and winning games in Blitz and even over the board games. And that is why I decided to record a revised version, because of course almost 10 years has gone since the time I recorded these first two videos about this, which is crazy. And uh, something's changed, some lines got improved since then, and I want to share with you the best way for you to proceed here. Alright, let's get into this. So after b3, black would have two common moves, either a pawn to e5 or moving the other central pawn, pawn to d5. And we're gonna analyze both of them. Let's start from pawn to e5. Then you play a bishop to b2, certainly, because you prepared this move by your previous move, pawn to b3. And now you're ready, take aim at this pawn, therefore black will need to protect it. Let's say they go knight to c6. Now you play pawn to e3, which is a nice flexible way. You're leaving the option of playing knight f3 in the future, or maybe to start off by playing the bishop to b5 to put more pressure onto the black c6 knight, and therefore to renew the threat to the pawn on e5. Black will play pawn to d5, again, very natural, just occupying the center, and now you play bishop to b5. Because this knight here is pinned, you're creating a threat of bishop takes e5, and black can now recapture, again, the knight is pinned. Actually, a lot of your opponents will miss this pin and will do something like pawn to a6 or bishop to d7, which doesn't make any sense because you're gonna then simply trade here on c6 and then win the pawn on e5. Anyway, many of your pawns will overlook it, but those who don't will play bishop to d6. Now, you still play knight to f3 and attack this pawn once again, giving them one more chance to blunder the central pawn, which will be cool. But if not, they'll play queen to e7, protecting this pawn once again with the queen. Now, in my old videos, I recommended here to play pawn to d4, which is not bad practically, but there is one problem here. If your opponent knows the proper line, which is pawn to e4, knight to e5, and here there is a very unpleasant move, queen to g5. Black goes into this sneaky attack, which is kind of unexpected and not appreciated. Because <laughs> here it's not easy for white to save their king side and you run into some trouble. That's why instead of playing this, it's actually better here to undermine the black center with another pawn, pawn to c4. And as you can see, this is overall the white's idea. You let black build up this pawn center, which looks good at first glance, but on the outside, it turns out that you can attack it both with your pieces and pawns, and this center quickly falls apart and rather becomes a problem for black than an asset. Now, after playing pawn to c4, you've got an obvious threat, pawn takes d5, and another hidden positional threat of pawn taking going to c5, and we're gonna take a look at this in a moment. Black can here take on c4, if they don't, it doesn't really change anything, you're gonna play the same moves. Let's say they trade here, you're recaptured by the pawn, they play knight to f6, and here's this key move pawn to c5, which helps you to completely destroy the black's position and, and open up your bishops. Because after they take, you take the pawn on e5, therefore it was not a sacrifice. Once again, the, the knight here is pinned, and also attacked by your knight from e5. And you can already see that white is putting some pressure here. And actually, you are attacking by your almost every move, except for the very first move, pawn to b3. Uh, on every next move, you create some sort of, of a threat, which is great. I don't forget, I don't remember who said this, maybe Carlson, that if you create 10 threats consequently, at least once your opponent will blunder. And now you're close to creating 10 threats in a row. All right, what can black do here? Let's say they play a bishop to d7 to protect this knight which is cool for you, because now you can take the bishop, queen takes, and this position is already winning for you. It's hard to believe, because it looks like it's just a normal middle game position, or maybe an opening position, but the point is, you've got these two monstrous bishops putting strong pressure on black. Also, you've got a lot of open lines that you can utilize for your attack. You can bring your queen out to f3, or to a4, or along the c-file, your d pawn is ready to be pushed to d4, attack the bishop in some variations, maybe it can go forward and attack the knight, and you've got really so much here into this position that it's very hard for black to keep up. For example, if they castle queenside, then you can play queen to a4, and after that you're putting pressure here, to c6, you can take there and disrupt their pawn structure, your rook potentially can play on c1 and join the attack here along the c-file, and at least you can win some win a pawn there, or maybe even to checkmate black's king. Also, you always have this d4 move coming. All right, let's take a move back here. This one is probably bad for black. 
What if they instead decide to castle king side? Then they run into another problem. Now your dark squared bishop comes into play and you first of all take here on f6, destroying their pawns. Then you can already can bring your queen out to h5 to directly attack the bishop and also to approach the black king so that you can possibly create some threats there in the future. And it's also pretty clear that black's position is going down. For example, if the bishop goes back, you can play d4, creating a threat of pawn to d5, by the way, winning the knight. And in addition to that, in this game they played king to h8, and after that, the move bishop d3 could win the game immediately because there is no defense against queen takes h7. Therefore, you can see how powerful this opening line is, and if you really ever want to play this move pawn to b3 for white, this can be a very deadly opening, and it's also a pretty universal one, which is cool, because you don't need to learn any Sicilian, Caracan, French, and whatnot, right? You're playing b3 opening, that's all. By the way, another cool thing about this line is that you can actually use the similar setup as black. If white plays pawn to e4 on the first move against you, you can then go pawn to b6 as black and use all the similar ideas that we just analyzed. There I also have some new interesting ideas for you, but I don't know if you're interested into this b3 and b6 stuff uh, overall, so you can vote for whether you want the continuation or not. And you can give a like to this video, and if this video gets 1000 likes, I'll know that you are interested, and I'll record a continuation about this line with b6 and how you can use the very similar setup for black. Alright, let's take at other moves that they can try against you. After b3, pawn to e5, bishop b2, you're attacking the pawn, they usually go knight to c6. By the way, I don't analyze here the move pawn to d6, because in those old videos which I mentioned previously, and I'll link them down below, I already analyzed this move and a couple other sidelines. So let's go into the main line in this video. Knight to c6, pawn to e3, d5, bishop b5, creating the threat of bishop takes e5. And now there are a couple spectacular ways for black to lose the game. One of them is bishop to d6, protecting it, then knight to f3, attacking here this pawn. And some of your opponents will say, hey, why not to push this pawn forward and attack this knight? because they think that you're playing some wrong weird moves and they may wish to punish you for that they don't know that you're actually well prepared you're not just playing some random moves and e4 is a great way for black to lose the game quickly and to go home because then it simply blunders bishop takes g7 and not only the pawn but it blunders the rook on the next move because after this series of little exchanges it's clear that you won the exchange because you got the rook for your knight and this pawn on g2 will be also taken pretty soon they try to somehow hold it, you can still play queen to h5 to say no, I'm gonna win this pawn, deflect this bishop and then win it with the rook, and you're crushing here actually. If they play queen to d7, still desperately trying to hold this pawn on g2 and to not let you get it back, there is also one interesting tactical operation you can play here, because they're threatening bishop takes h2 potentially and grab your rook. So first you can take here on c6, they have to take with a pawn because the queen needs to keep protection of the bishop, or else you will take it with your queen, therefore they'll take with a pawn, and then you play a bishop to e5, so that you block out this bishop and can't ever take on h2, and you save the decisive material advantage, you're then just gonna play knight to c3, castle, and sooner or later you'll win this pawn anyway, and the position is completely winning here. So that's one of the great ways for you to turn the situation around when black thought that they are trying to attack and they're going down immediately. Let's come back to the critical position of this variation, where white just played knight to f3, threatening to capture this pawn on e5. We just analyzed that e4 is not a good option for black, because if bishop takes g7, what if they try pawn to f6? It's not all that bad, objectively speaking, but realistically black usually mess up real quick after that, and that's actually great if they play this move pawn to f6 against you, because it weakens their position a little bit, all these white squares. Also, the knight cannot come out to f6 anymore, and all in all, your position is pretty good here. You're gonna play pawn to d4 here to attack the black center, because usually you attack it either with pawn to d4 or with pawn to c4 or both of them. Right, in this case, after pawn to d4, taking here on d4 is probably pretty bad, because that opens up the position and all these weaknesses will come into play very soon. You can recapture with the queen, for example, because the knight is pinned, and it's pretty clear that black's position is not all that good. You can play knight c3, castle, and you're gonna be crushing here. So taking is, is a bad choice for black. What if they push pawn to e4? Then, well, you need to move your knight back, and here your idea is that you can undermine the center further by playing pawn to c4 on the next move. And they usually go something like knight to e7, trying to develop pieces normally, and then you play pawn to c4, and black find themselves in trouble, because 
you're threatening to play pawn takes d5 and after that to win this pawn on e4. That's the single threat that they usually notice and they play something like pawn to a6. Which is a terrible move because after this exchange, even though it helps black to save their pawn structure in the center, it fails to c5 trap in the bishop. So you're gonna win a lot of games like this, which is a lot of fun. But even if Blank don't blunder this thing, let's just take a few moves back and analyze the position in general. Even if Black finds some way to keep up the position overall, you're still putting this strong pressure onto their center. You can bring the other knight to c3 to you know put one more attack onto this. You also have a positional idea to play a bishop to a3 at some point and trade off your bad bishop for their good bishop keeping all the other ideas of the position. Therefore, you have a lot of ideas here, even in case black does not fall victim of this c5 trap. But very often they will, and you win the game immediately. All in all, strangely enough, it turns out that the move pawn to e5 may be not the best choice for black here, practically speaking, because very often they run into trouble after that, which is hard to believe that such a move as pawn to e5 can be kind of a mistake. No, not really, but in real games, it often does. All right, what if they play pawn to d5? The other way to handle this pawn to b3 move. Then it leads into a bit different type of positions. You play bishop b2, let's say they go pawn to c5. In this case, they can't play e5 because this square is under the fire of your bishop, so they tr can try putting their pawns in the center that way. Then you still play pawn to e3 and Strangely enough, your moves are the same, even though black is doing something different. And if they ever bring their knight to c6, that's great for you, because then you play a bishop to b5, still putting this bishop on a very active position. Very often your opponents will play something like this, without really realizing that they're playing the second best moves here. Here they play a bishop d7, you follow up with knight to f3, the normal moves, and according to the database, most frequently they actually play pawn to a6, which just shows it clearly that they are clueless of what's going on here, because playing pawn to a6 doesn't make any sense. You will probably have to go into take there sooner or later anyway, and playing pawn to a6 only helps you doing that. So you take there, after that you can land your knight on this great outpost square e5, from here it attacks the bishop, potentially ready to break their pawn structure, and of course overall puts a lot of pressure onto black's position. They play queen c7, or something like this, to protect the bishop, so that they can recapture with the queen. But you are not going to take there anytime soon, your knight on e5 is great, why would you wish to trade it for no reason? So you simply castle, they play pawn to e6, and here there is another common idea, pawn to f4. Which not only supports your knight, but also gives some freedom and space advantage for your heavy pieces on the queen side, so that they can somehow be used there on the queen side. Let's say they go knight f6, then you play pawn to d3, you wish to develop your knight to d2 to keep your bishop open, because if you put it to c3 it will block the way of your bishop, and that's why you'll play pawn to d3, so that your knight can be moved there on the next move. They go bishop d6, you play knight d2, castling, and in this position it's actually already winning for white, which is cool, because that's how black usually treat this kind of position, which is completely wrong. First of all, you've got the general attacking plan of using the power of this dark squared bishop, and, oops, and then this thing, and then you can bring one of your heavy pieces, either queen can come here for this maneuver, or through e1, you can bring it either to g3 or h4, or your rook can come here by f3, either to g3, most likely, or maybe to h3. So you've got a lot of ideas of how to bring your heavy pieces and involve them into your attack, with the support of this monstrous bishop, it's gonna be crushing for black. But in this particular position, you have even more or less forcing way to win. Because you can start trading here, first on c6, then you can take an f6 to open up their king position, and after that, queen comes out to h5, and black is already defenseless against your very simple threat of rook to f3, rook to h3, and then queen takes h7, something like this. If they try king h8, rook to f3, and here, in order to stop you from playing rook f3 and delivering a checkmate, they would have to go rook g8 and give up all the pawns, because now you take this pawn and attack the two other pawns. So if they play something like this, you then take another pawn on e6, and you're saving all the advantages of your position, their king is still weak, and along the way you collected a couple of pawns, that's easily winning for you. Now, what if you are playing a really strong and well-prepared opponent who is familiar with all these ideas and they're playing kind of perfect moves. So they play pawn to d5 and after that they never play pawn to c5 so that you never have a chance to bring your bishop there to b5, right? 
And that's why they refrain from playing that move, and they always play something else. So after e3 they play pawn to e6, knight of 3 they're still not playing c5, they're playing bishop to e7. Now you don't have this opportunity of bishop coming to b5, well you've got it, but it doesn't make sense. And therefore you have to find something else. What do you do in this case? There are a couple of ways, of course, to deal with this position. I like the move pawn to c4, and after they castle, you follow up with a knight to c3. Here you a little bit switch the angle of your attack, and instead you start playing positionally, putting pressure onto their center. Now there are a couple of ways for them to proceed. They'll usually either play pawn to c5 or pawn to b6, but for you it does not really matter, because you're going to use the same moves anyway. Let's say they play pawn to c5, then you take here on d5, they usually recapture with a pawn, which is wrong, but they do it anyway, and then you play pawn to d4. And the idea here for you is that you're getting this long-term target for your attack, the weak pawn d5, which they cannot support with their other pawns because it cannot go backward, right? So that'll be a long-term weakness. And after you finish your development, you'll keep attacking this central pawn. And black's position is pretty unpleasant here. Let's take a couple moves back and I'll just show you what you can do in case they play pawn to b6, because it really doesn't change much. You still use all the same ideas. You trade here on d5, and you still play pawn to d4, and sooner or later they will have to play pawn to c5 anyway, because, you know, otherwise this is a backward pawn, you're gonna attack it along the c file, right here, right, so they'll probably have to push it, and then you're gonna attack along the c file, and also all this weak pawn on d5, maybe this weak pawn c7, so you have this long-term lasting positional initiative and pressure against their central weak pawns. So it's not completely crushing or winning, but you know, you can't always hope to win, it only happens if your opponent falls victim of a tricky line that you use, but sometimes they won't, and then you have to play positionally. But still, I love this position, it's a great way for white to treat it, and it's really hard for black actually to come up with any reasonable plan here. And now it's a quick fun time, as well as the quiz time for you. There was a game that finished just in 9 moves between two very strong grandmasters. White player was Adhiban from India, and black player is Navara, who's one of the world's top players. His best rating was 2750, I'm talking FIDA rating, not Internet Blitz rating. So that is a very high level player. Here white played pawn to c4, not the move that I suggest, but anyway, let's quickly go through this game. Knight of 3, attacking the pawn, black decided to push it forward, knight d4. Knight bishop to c5, attacking this knight again, and then knight to f5. In this game, you can also see the power of this bishop, and together with this knight, white already started creating some problems for black early in the game. Black decided to castle, white plays pawn to e3, black decided to play pawn to d5 to try and attack this knight on f5, but white didn't go back, instead he took here on d5, saying, hey, if you want to take this knight, I'll take the other knight on c6, and also break your pawn structure, and then we'll later attack these weaknesses. And I guess after a long thinking, Black realized that none of the options looked too good for them, and they decided to take here with the knight, hoping to, you know, complicate game and still get some chances. And now it's your turn to find the winning move for white. Funnily enough, Black just resigned here after the white's next move, so you can definitely try to find it and write it down in the comments below if you can. It's a very rare case where a super grandmaster loses the game in nine moves. All right. Uh, don't forget that if you wish me to cover the same opening choice from the black perspective, how you can play b6 as black, then vote for it, give a like to this video, and if it gets 1000 likes, I'll know that you guys are interested and I will record in continuation. And also, if you want to know my best methods that help my students get great progress in chess, you may check out my free masterclass by clicking the link on the screen or down below in the video description.